join all the student associations, the organisations that you can, that you're interested in. You should talk to people. Talk to your professors, talk to professionals and talk to your peers. To be proactive and to accumulate as much experience as possible during your study. Studies are of course very important and you should focus on those. But I truly believe that these activities also form part of your academic path and your academic experience. First, look around, make connections. You might be colleagues someday. Number two, enjoy all of your student life experiences, the good and the bad. If you didn't win, it was a lesson. And you'll always win if you consider everything a lesson. Number three, don't stress too much. Number four, failing to plan is planning to fail. Choose one area of law that you really like and get to know everything about it. Choose the area you want to work in. If you can't make up your mind, think about who you are and what sort of work would enable you to be yourself. Really appreciate the network you're building, your professors, your classmates, your colleagues, the people that you get to meet in different volunteer positions, internships. Make sure you cherish those connections and keep them because they're going to be very, very useful for you in the future. I know. Um, treat your assignments and uh, your group works and everything that you do as an opportunity. Bank on them for your future. Really, really enjoy the ride because the time will pass by so quickly. And then when you look back, as cliche as it sounds, you're going to think, whoa, that was my best time of my life. Also, keep believing in yourself, in your strengths and capabilities because you're able to graduate and you will be great. Keep working hard, keep pushing yourself because you're all winners. Good luck. I'm aware that the industry that we're all about to enter, or at least that we're all working towards, is a highly competitive one. Um, there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of comparison for a lot of us. There's a lot of overstressing and overthinking, and um, that can really weigh you down. My first piece of advice would be to I know it's easier said than done, but to try and limit that. Do not let those things consume you. Do not let those things make you feel bad, weigh you down. Things will fall into their place. Things somehow always work out in the end. Just put in the work and don't overstress. Make the best use of your student years, of your university years. Do everything you can to make those student years count, to make them memorable, to enjoy them as much as you can, to form lots of friendships and make a lot of memories take every possible opportunity that there is um, not even think about it just do it get outside of your comfort zone go and uh, participate in mood court or chess up uh, go on exchange i think that it's really important to um, to take those um, opportunities and develop um, your skills, invest in yourself and don't be afraid. Never stop asking questions. Ask the people you study with, the people who teach you, the people you meet. They have a lot of experience in many different areas. Is it studying, work, just life? Do not hesitate to also dive into topics where you didn't have any contact with before. It might be interesting to get new insights, have a total different perspective on things. This can help you to develop yourself, find what you are ambitious for, and to grow. Enjoy your student years as much as possible. So go attend that class early in the morning that you think will not help you. Spend the whole night studying for an exam, even if you don't get, get any sleep. Uh, make sure to attend the parties organized by the university because it's so much fun to hang out with your professors outside of class. Make sure that you get as involved as possible in everything that the university offers you because it offers a lot of opportunities to network, to meet new people, to make connections and they are very helpful for your future career. Make sure you find balance. Just like anything else in life, too little or too much of something is never good. The key to a healthy and happy life is to find balance in your everyday life. When it's time for you to study, 
give a hundred percent of focus and concentration and get your work done get your assignments done study for exams do the mood courts take every opportunity you have go apply for internships all the Impor most important international organizations and courts are there. Go and discover diplomacy. Go and discover what what is your passion? Which area of law are you passionate about? Work hard, but when it's time where you're free, put your work aside and take time for yourself. Take time for your friends, for your family. Go approach strangers, make new friendships. Try to enjoy every moment and try to make the most of every opportunity that you have. So try and enjoy it and make the most of every opportunity in the midst of all the exams and all the stress. Don't worry too much. You're doing your best and it will all work out. Um, I think it, it can feel really stressful with assignments and exams and a lot of pressure, but keep going. Don't worry too much. Make the most of every opportunity and you'll look back and wonder how the time went so fast. Try to do as much internships or voluntary work or things that you're drawn to in your pastime uh, to kind of find out where your passions lay and to be able to put that on your resume. Not to stress about the masters too much. In a nutshell, my advice would be to um, try to figure out where your passions lay, uh, what you'd like to do after you're, you're done studying, enjoy your freedom as a student and um, don't stress too much. You network more. Definitely get to know as many people as you can. Try to attend all of the uh, network events which are organized by the university. Uh, attend all the guest lectures because you never know who you will meet and you never know who will be able to help you when you are stuck during your career or professional life. Dear ladies and gentlemen, friends, students and guests, bonjour. Welcome from The Hague in the Netherlands to the ceremony of the Employee Network Event 2021, 10th edition. My name is Aurélien Lorange, senior lecturer in international and EU law at The Hague University of Applied Science and founder 
of the employer network events, commonly known as NA. It is a tradition that every edition, a different member of the faculty of the law program is a master of ceremony of this event. After my colleague, Miera Montero last year, this is my turn for this edition, which is the 10th anniversary. 10 years ago, I was young and full of energy. And now I am less young, but still full of energy. And since then, we welcome more than 500 employers, 50 universities in the building of the Egg University to network and speak with our students, alumni and colleagues. We all learned a lot and we made many new connections. So many thanks. When my colleague, Mr. Dundunen, and the founder of the law program, Ernst van Vebelen van Trent, were thinking how to thank employers for taking our students in internship back in 2011, we did not know that it would become a job fair, even less the longest established one in the Netherlands for young international legal professionals. Today, normally, we would have welcomed all of you here in The Hague, like it was during the first eight ENEs. This ENE 2021 is the second online ENE we organized after last year, fully online. And we, will, and we hope next year we will be back in person in the building of the Egg University of Applied Science. Until then, please stay safe. So welcome to this 10th anniversary. To our students, connect with more speakers and get to continue networking for your careers and for helping each other. To our guest universities, may you get to know more about the students and the faculty and our prestigious speakers. To our employers, may we still contribute to your activities remotely and soon in person. And finally, to our alumni, greetings to you in the 70 countries where you are currently. Today, we'll have a few words from Lidwin Bremer, our dean, followed by two interviews conducted by our students with an high official of the European Union and from a Dutch multinational company on the job market and education in 2021. And finally, two alumni talking about their successful careers. Now, we would like to give the floor to our dean, Lidwin Bremer responsible for the Faculty of Public Management, Law and Safety. Good day. Welcome to the Egg University of Applied Sciences. To the 10th anniversary edition of the Employee Network Center, of the International Security Law Program. Please follow me. From the International City of Peace and Justice, and through an ambitious and practice-oriented learning environment, the law program aims to educate all citizens to shape excellent and adaptable legal professionals who embrace today's and tomorrow's legal challenges and opportunities. Now, how is that for a mission statement? I think that is a really wonderful mission statement. Over the past years, the law program has grown to be the biggest program in the Faculty of Bestuur, Recht and Veiligheid, Public Management, Law and Safety with over 1,100 students today, more coming in next September. I'm immensely proud of the law program. And if there ever was a time where there is a need for excellent, adaptable, legal, applied professionals who embrace today's and tomorrow's challenges and opportunities, it is now. Because, you know, look, look around, you look at the world, look at what's happening. I was watching a video of um, the director of the Social Cultural Planning Office in the Netherlands, Kim Petters, yesterday, who was saying that the two main challenges for this day and age are inclusiveness and sustainability. And the pandemic, I think, we have seen over the past year has only added to those challenges. And what about the impact of law in that respect? I think law, study of law, the application of law is vital to ensure that we can leave this world order for the next generations in a perhaps slightly better shape than it is today. Think, for instance, 
of the accessibility of websites. Think of the accessibility of justice for people in poorer neighborhoods of The Hague. Think of fiscal regulations that allow the same excellent big pharma companies who have been able to develop vaccines so quickly to allow them to not to uh, be taxed very strongly and actually not to uh, contribute for tax paying at all to the Dutch society even though they are based in the Netherlands. So law is on the one hand contributing to a better world but if law is not used well it can also contribute to keeping balances which perhaps are not right. I think that is one of the major challenges of today and tomorrow and I'm very happy to know that amongst the law students of this day and age and among the alumni that will be speaking to you today there are those who have taken up those challenges and are working towards a better future. If there ever was a time where there's a need for all citizens educating the Hague with the access to the international institutions and access to poor neighborhoods here in the Hague. If there ever was a need for applied legal professionals, it is now. I leave you with this message and perhaps with a final message to all the current students working in our program today. You have shown such resilience over the past year, being able to study only online, do your exams online. We are happy that as of next September there will be more opportunity for you to study in The Hague, even hopefully with the help of student associations already before the summer. But be, be sure that the resilience you have been developing, that's a muscle you can train, that you have developed a skill over the past couple of, uh, couple of months, year even, that will stand you in such good stead for years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lidrin. And now this is the interview of the EU Commissioner for Education, Research and Innovation, Maria Gabriel, that you, Dean Bremer, conducted with the Vice President of the Board of the University of Applied Science, Rasha Raval, and four students from International and EU Law, International Business, Sports, and European Studies. Hello, Commissioner, dear Commissioner. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, well, good, good to I'm, see you. Good. Thank you. Welcome. And uh, as you can see, we we are a bit early, to be honest. Um, so. Me too. Ah, yes, I see. Uh, so I can already introduce uh, the students briefly, but as well, we have our Vice President, uh, Rasha Raval, who is here. And, and, uh, and uh, Lijin Bremer, our dean, will connect, uh, will open our camera in a few seconds. Uh, we have prepared some uh, questions, but maybe uh, the students, you can introduce yourself already, Mr. Khalil. Good afternoon, ma'am. It's an honor to have you here amongst us today. My name is Altamish Khalil. I'm a second year international European law student at the Hague University of Applied Sciences. Nice to meet you, Khalil. Nice to meet you too, ma'am. Ms. Voss? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Danielle Vossen. I'm a student, second year student sport management at the Hague University as well. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank uh, you Ms. Tsenkoua? Good afternoon. Your microphone. We don't yes. hear you very well. Can you now? Now it's better. Yeah. Um, no. Um, I'm good. Yes, Miss Bogdanova. Hello, nice to meet you. My name is Gagana. I am coming from Bulgaria, a final year international business student. And thank you for joining us today. And uh, our, yeah. our vice president. Then, sorry, hi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Raj Raoul, and uh, as Orion says, I'm uh, Vice President of the institution with the Portfolio of Education, and it is a fantastic honour that you are able to share some time with us today. It's an honour for me, Vice President. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dean Bremer, do you hear us? 
I, I think Jim Wimmer will, will uh, join in a few seconds. Um, so maybe we could start with uh, uh, some questions. Uh, could you maybe start, Mr. Khalil, with your first question? Absolutely. So uh, my, my question revolves around uh, the pandemic and the mental distress that our students faced. So the pandemic has troubled us in various ways that we had never imagined. And mental health is a very important aspect of a student's life. And during the pandemic, as you all witnessed, a lot of students went through mental distress. So my question is, under the European education area, are there any specific goals for mental health education? Well, thank you very much, Kalia, for your question. First, I would like to say that, yes, we are aware that for our young people, that's a particularly difficult period. But at the same time, allow me to say that I want to tell them thank you. Thank you for your resistance, for your resilience, for your engagement. And yes, uh, it's uh, logic that in the new European uh, education area and with the Erasmus Plus program, we'll pay more and more attention to this issue. That was already part of the previous program, but definitely this time we'll have a specific accent on this. And that's why with the new Erasmus Plus program, yes, I confirm that we'll pay more attention and we have more projects dedicated to this so crucial issue. Thank you so much. It was lovely to know that. Thank you. I, I will give the floor now to Maidin. Uh, Did you remember who just uh, connected? Uh, maybe uh, could you maybe introduce yourself as well? Thank you so much. Gospeja Gabriel. Very pleased to have you with us. Very honored. Um, I was wondering, in these uh, very strange times with the pandemic, we feel that the world is facing many, many challenges. Um, in your, uh, in, with your experience, with your background, how, what, how do you feel uh, future legal professionals with an applied training? How do you think they, what challenges are the most important for them to address? Well, first of all, I would like to say that it's a difficult period, it's a crisis, but I see this time as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to join forces, uh, to have more targeted actions. And for a first time, maybe yes, with our st member states to have an unprecedented amount of investment in these critical fields that we can use in order to achieve better results. So it's for us as a European Commission, it's very clear that the main priorities are linked to the green and digital transitions. And that's why all our different policies with Horizon Europe program, with Erasmus Plus program are linked. 35% of our Horizon Europe program will be dedicated to climate change ob uh, objectives. With the Erasmus Plus program, we would, we would like to have a program that is more inclusive and more, more green and digital for our young people. So for me here, the main challenge is this time how to build real synergies. But the challenge is to transform this beautiful world into something tangible and operational. Because for many years, we are talking about how to link skills with innovation, how to link research with industry, how to link our young people in universities with our regions. So this time, it, we need definitely to transform this into something concrete. And I'm very glad that we are in a good way because for the first time, there is opportunities to build synergies between the policies that are within my portfolio. That means education, research, innovation, youth, culture, and sport, together with our regional policies, together with our innovation policy. And that's for me the main, the main issue now. How, with your experience, with your ideas, to stop a little bit with the top-down approach, to listen more people like you, to give you more voice, and united to use this momentum in order to achieve better results. For me, that's, that's, that's the answer. Because I must say that if I would like to stay coherent, it's not up to me to tell you what you need to do, but it's up to me to listen to you what are the biggest challenges and difficulties that you meet every day on the ground and to be there to support with the right policies, with the flexible instruments that you can use to, 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 to make the situation better? Thank you. And maybe a question from our Vice President, Rasha Shabal. Yeah, the, the, thank you, uh, Orion. Um, one of the uh, 
question. I have two questions, and one one is a sort of maybe negative, and the other is positive. So I've decided it's raining outside, so I'm going to go with the positive one. Uh, over the over the pandemic and um, the the contact that you've had with the the the, uh, the landscape, as it were, what has been the thing in educational innovation that has most impressed you? Well, that's exactly the capacity of innovation that impressed me the most because we have so much good examples that yes the period was inter with a lot of interruptions with a lot of difficulties but at the same time we all have seen how the community is able to provide support and to innovate one concrete concrete example that was uh, an, an a project with the european institute of innovation and, and technology and that that was a project where the different young people can endorse different roles to be entrepreneurs, to be investors, to be advisors. That's the, the name of the project is Battle for Green Ta Talent. And that was amazing to see that they are able to innovate. They are able not only to propose ideas, but to transform them into projects and to realize them. And that's for me the main lesson. It's not enough to make the link between education and innovation. We need to give to our young people possibilities to realize themselves, their ideas, making maybe, yes, here more easier the links with the different ecosystems, with the regional level, with the different actors that can help them at the right moment for with the right tools. And I'm very glad that we'll work in this direction very precisely. We have different concrete examples i already mentioned the european institute of innovation and technology and dear young people i would like really to see you more and more involved in their projects i would like to mention the european universities alliances another pilot project for our european education area it's very clear for me they have not so much time now to show us that the challenge-based approach that with innovation they can tackle at least topics that are there for 20 years, but we need finally, because we have new technologies to find solutions. And I must say that I'm very grateful for the extraordinary enthusiasm and involvement that, that I obtained from, from them. And one, one last point, I think that when we talk about education and innovation, we have to address some of some complex issues. I'm talking here about artificial intelligence and the role in the education process. And I'm very glad to share with you that next month in June, I will create a high level expert group to tackle this issue, to propose us guidelines. Because I think that when we talk about new technologies, artificial intelligence, yes, we are part of this generation that support, that can see what are the positive aspects to make the education more interactive, more individualized, more user-friendly. But at the same time, we must be really aware that that is not the case for all our teachers, for all our regions, for all our young people. So yes, definitely real bridge between education and innovation. But what I would like to see is that they work hand in hand since the beginning of the project by the very end of the realization of this project. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bogdanova, you had a question a bit connected to this? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, looking at the trends worldwide, we see a decline of number of people, generally speaking, uh, that are available to work. And also what you mentioned, that there is new technologies, there's automation, robotization, they continue to disrupt our uh, market. But in your opinion, how will these trends affect the possibility of uh, future success in the coming years for the generations that are entering the labor market? And what skills do you think they, that we would need to be able to succeed? Thank you very much, Gergana. Well, for sure, we all need digital skills. It's obvious today because we know that more than 90% of all the jobs will require the, uh, basic digital skills at least. And we have only 47% of the European population and only 35% of the workforce of Europe. So that means that for me, there is no miracle solution, but we have to integrate different policies into different levels. Of course, we need more digital skills into the entire cycle of education, primary, secondary, higher education. 
And I'm really very glad that we, the Erasmus Plus program, will put an accent on this, especially with our digital education action plan. Here, when we talk about digital skills, one special attention to girls, a topic very close to my heart, because we need more girls in STEM education, in vocational education and training in artificial intelligence. And one concrete example with the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, we are proposing an initiative trainings for 40,000 girls by 27. The second thing, we have a lot of young people that didn't finish their studies, or we have people already on the labor market, they want to change, they want to seize the opportunities that are offered by new technology. That's why we need, we need reskilling and upskilling. But what is the problem? That today we have 110 million European citizens follow, following online courses and trainings, but there is no European recognition for that courses. There is no clear criteria how this will impact in a positive way their career, how they, they, can, they can find new jobs. And that's why I propose to have a European framework for micro-credentials. It's really time, and here universities have a real role to play, it's really time to have a common definition, to be recognized at European level, and to motivate people to follow, to follow this. Finally, I think that it's really important to stay very open with our mind because there is some analysis showing that 60% of the future jobs for the young people that actually are in primary school, we don't know them. So we need here on one side, yes, to give them the possibility to have digital skills, but on the other side, we need to continue in parallel to develop their creativity, their entrepreneurial spirit, the soft powers and the soft, uh, the soft instruments and capacities that will help us to be flexible, to learn. And that's why our approach is lifelong learning approach. So I think that that's, that's a real change, but it will be up to us to fulfill this with content at all stages. And I very much count on you because I'm sure that you have other ideas I will be very glad that we'll have another opportunities to share, to share more about this, but thank you. Thank you very much for raising this so much important issue. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sankova. Yes, I hope you can hear me now. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so my question is quite related to the technical issue um, in alignment with the COVID-19 crisis, the European Commission published the 2000 21-2027 Digital Education Action Plan, uh, which just for context aims to facilitate the online learning process. Um, and the plan itself recognizes the disparities um, in access to internet connection and technology within the European Union. So I was wondering how is the European Commission practically going to assist member states in supporting low income households, um, which might experience difficulties with accessing the needed tools? Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine, for this question. Yes, during the crisis, what we all have seen that for sure we have strengths, but we have weaknesses, especially when we talk about connectivity, when we talk about equipments, when we talk about vulnerable groups, and we need to tackle these issues, especially because, yes, disparities between member states are here. I must say that I, I stay confident that we are leaving a momentum where it will be up to all of us to tackle this issue. Why? First, because now we have the Digital Education Action Plan and the European Education Area. And when you look at the Digital Education Action Plan, you can see very concrete initiatives. I will mention only one, connectivity for schools. Yes, I will use my previous experience as Digital Commissioner and the Wi-Fi for EU project, because we need good connectivity for rural and remote areas. That's tackling one of the disparities between and within member states. The other is, yes, we need to invest in equipment. And this time we have the resilience and recovery facility, the national plans. 20% of those plans should be invested in order to achieve our digital goals. And if you'd like to achieve them, we need to invest in equipment. And I must say that now for many weeks and many months, I'm following very closely how our member states are advancing with their drafts 
and I stay confident. They all agree and they all really receive the, the, the message. The question it will be after how we can build synergies with other instruments. That's why for me, the investment that our member states are doing with the resilience and recovery facility plans should be linked to our initiatives like the European University Alliances, like the Digital Education Hub, that's another important idea. And we need to link that to innovation. We need to link that to our innovation ecosystem where with companies, with the private sector, we can be sure that all those investments in equipment, in connectivity, in skills will be profitable to us as a society. So for me, that's the main challenge, that this investment is just not spending the money, that will be a pity, but we need to see that as a strategic investment in our future to be more resilient, more competitive, more efficient as economy and as society. Thank you. Ms. Voss, with Student Sports. Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, so we have a sport related question, of course. Uh, so we all know that COVID-19 has made a huge impact on the, on the economy. Um, and I saw in a questionnaire, you mentioned that you want to use sport as a driver for economic growth, employment and innovation. Uh, so my question is, how can sport contribute to those three pillars? And what are the plans of the EU to provide this after COVID? So when everything is possible again. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this question. Well, I think that not so much often that we are talking about sport as a, an economic activity and numbers are quite impressive because we are talking about more than 5 million jobs and we are talking about more than 2% of the European GDP. So yes, we need here to strengthen our investment in sport. At the same time, I must say that within my competence, I'm very glad that the first positive message is that we managed to double the budget within Erasmus Plus for the sports strand. For the entire next period, 21-27, we have 470 million euros. The other thing is that, you know, we are investing in projects, we are investing in activities, but we are not investing in infrastructure. So that's why this beautiful word synergy should again be mentioned and translated into something more concrete. And that's why I'm very glad that we have projects like SHARE, where for the first time we try to promote this collaboration between our regions, between the funding coming from the European Regional Development Fund and what we have with Erasmus Plus and Horizon Europe program in order to strengthen the possible collaborations and the possible positive impact. So we, yes, now we are at the beginning, the positive, the solid base, it's the good budget, the good will to go in this direction, but that stays a huge challenge. So next few years, it's up to us to follow this very closely. We need to continue to raise awareness. We need to work very closely with our regions and with our member states, and we need to, to, to work closely with our sport community, grassroots and professionals in order to preserve the European model of sport. We all agree that some, that's something that we stand behind and it's important in these critical times to protect it. So, yes, that's my answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dean Bremer, do you have another question, possibly? Yes, uh, Mrs. Gabriel, I think, in fact, earlier today you had another meeting with uh, the Dutch Universities of Applied Science. Uh, um, so, uh, of course, the European higher education landscape is very diverse. Not in all European countries there is a system with research universities and applied sciences universities. Uh, so, I was wondering, what, what is your uh, vision on how University of Applied Sciences, especially ones with international programs such as ours, how they can contribute to, yeah, to a better future for Europe? You are key, you are driver, and we would like to count on you. That's my message, because yes, universities of applied sciences are very often known for their more professional oriented degree. You are here as a bridge between higher education, vocational education and training and labor market. So I think that it's absolutely possible and absolutely important for us to continue to support your activities. 
At the same time, yes, I think that here we have some novelties under our programs where there is new perspectives for applied sciences. I would like to mention our missions within Horizon Europe program, our European Innovation Council and our European University Alliances again. I will not talk about University Alliances, you know how important it is, but here you have this extraordinary experience because universities of applied science are our local and regional actors and i don't stop to talk about synergies with regions so we very much need this expertise but i would like here to insist on our missions because that's something completely new with the new horizon era program you know that we have five topics where we consider if i i, I should express this in one sentence that we would like to, to show that because we are taking actions at European level, there is a difference in the daily life of our European citizens. Mission on cancer and four missions linked directly to the European Green Deal. Mission on climate adaptation, mission on climate neutral and smart cities, mission on oceans, water, seas, and mission on soil and food. So here, since the beginning, we, we said, we would like to have a portfolio of actions where in a co-creation and co-design pro process, we can show to our citizens what are the concrete benefits for them. And that's why we need you, because you can be this, this link. You are, for me, the driver to be the convincing force to see that there is a direct link between universities, between skills, education, together immediately with innovation with products with services with industry with competitiveness with leadership and that's why i very much count on you okay. thank you very much for that we'll try and live up to your expectations do you have vice president do you have a second question i do thank you uh, and i'd like to possibly lean off to um, lead off with the with your last comment again as Ludwig says uh, we're very grateful for that. That's music to our ears. We just need to convince the Dutch government that that's always the case as well. But maybe you can help us with that. So um, you've mentioned a couple of times European university uh, associations and the, the, the conglomerations of universities. We're a part of one of the uh, projects. Um, and my question is, do you think, and again, I don't want to base too much on the pandemic, but what the pandemic has done is certainly opened up the world up for digital collaborations and it's made many things much easier i mean again today's meeting for example would have taken us a lot more time had it been in real life now it's digital we can combine different things in that way uh, do you see that from from the perspective of the commission that the distances that used to be there are now going to get smaller particularly with education and research and innovation and the way things work and how do you see the partnership of the european universities helping that out well, European universities, uh, it's a great initiative. And I think that we have to pay a lot of attention already of the experience because 60% of them already started to share online resources. And 80% of them are saying that if this initiative uh, would be there one year before, they will be better prepared for this kind of crisis. So I think that here together with the European universities alliances, we need to continue to show in a very concrete way what that means that since the beginning, the community of education together with private sector, with regions is working together. It's working together to offer to our students enough flexibility and more confidence for the jobs of the future. So I think that for me, first question, it will be to pay a lot of attention to this experience, to draw the right lessons, because don't forget that your alliances have only three years to show us that we are going in the good direction. After, of course, I'm fully aware that you are looking for a sustainable funding. So yes, in 2022, you have some positive news, I hope for all of you. Uh, and after, of course, we need to see how this experience is fitting in the digital age, in the European education area, and more broadly to our green and digital transitions. So, 
yeah, I think that we are living extraordinary times. We are talking not only about budget, we are not talking about concrete actions, but allow me to say we are talking about the European leadership. All this initiative that I mentioned, that's my my main demand now to all the, the entire community that somehow I'm responsible with my portfolio is don't hesitate to be bold, to propose us innovative solutions, to be ambitious, because yes, as European Union, it's really time to transform our leadership in science into leadership in innovation. And the best way is exactly what you said, Vice President. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bogdanova, do you have a second question? Uh, it will be the last two questions before, because you have another meeting. So, Ms. Bogdanova. Yes, thank you so much. I have more of a personal question to you, uh, Commissioner, and that is what are your personal drivers for success? Well, <laughs> uh, always uh, a little bit frustrating this, this question because for sure, there is a huge wish to learn every day. There is a huge pleasure to meet people and not only to meet, but to exchange and to have a regular dialogue. It's, of course, a huge wish to see Europe speaking more loudly on some questions and Europe that is more ambitious and more courageous on some issues like education, innovation, research, culture, and youth. So I think that here, if I must only have one sentence, it's really dream, don't hesitate to pursue your dream, learn, be flexible because not always the path is that you previously planned it. And yes, stay very positive with all those that are around you. You always have something to learn from everyone. And it's, of course, after up to you to take what will be crucial for your personal and professional development and not to take, but always with respect and with values, our European values for those that are on your way. So that's my my main my main motivation. Thank you. And very last question, Mr. Kadir. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for your inspiring words, first of all. Uh, speaking of European Union and universities, uh, I'd like to mention the European University in Initiative. So it's one of the most uh, politically like discussed political projects in higher education and research. So I wanted to know in particular how, what is the difference between how it started before the pandemic and how the challenges, what kind of challenges you encountered when the pandemic hit and how have you been trying to overcome uh, these challenges? Well, thank you very much, Khalil. I think that I already mentioned one of, one of the challenges. It was really how we can tackle issues like interoperability, shared resources, and how we, how we can we can better coordinate this. And that brings me to my second point, what we discovered that it's need, we need better coordination at European level. And our member states more and more are aware of this. I must say that when the crisis uh, has started in March 2020, one of the first things that we met with our ministers of education, that was to establish a platform where we can start to exchange good practices and we can start to see how the crisis is managed in our different countries. And they discovered new instruments, new practices, new experiences. And for me, that was a surprise that all are not aware of all the different opportunities and possibilities that they have to use them to offer to their universities, to their research institutes, the necessary support and the necessary flexibility. So I think that we should continue in this direction. And I must say that I already proposed to our ministers to, to preserve this platform as a regular tool. And that's why it's so important that we have the same now with the resilience and recovery facility plans, because in a few weeks, we'll all discover 
how much of our countries decided to use these opportunities, but we'll all pay attention if they already integrated the lessons learned, the challenges and the difficulties faced by our universities, faced by our young people during the crisis, and how they will use the new instruments to propose new, new solutions. So I think that that was a great time where we learned a lot, but it's true that if we don't have enough investment, if we don't have enough cooperation, and if we don't anticipate with targeted actions, it will be impossible for us as Europe to have better results in this field. Because allow me to say that when we talk about education, you know what are the limited competencies of the European Commission, what are the competencies of our member states, and believe me, they are keeping them very, very jealously. But this time, what is different, and that's why the crisis is an opportunity, is that we are aware that we need to move forward. We need to speed up some of the processes. We need to change and to innovate if we would like to tackle not only old and previous issues, if you'd like to tackle just the challenges of our common future. And this time, I'm really more confident. Thank you. I want to give the floor now to our Dean to close maybe this session. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Gabriel, for sharing your thoughts and ideas with us and uh, painting such a picture for us of European initiatives, which in these unprecedented times and despite the, the, the problems that there always are, of course, between the member states and European uh, Union, at this moment, you your message is one of hope and one of ambition and one of initiative. And I think this is a very important message uh, for you to share with, uh, with our students. Thank you very much uh, on behalf of staff and students of the International European Law Programme at the Hague University of Applied Sciences. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate this, this moment. If you allow me, and I know that is not the protocol, I'd like to mention two, uh, two additional points because I think that all our young people are involved and they can can and should be the drivers uh, to, to achieve our objectives for the to be the climate neutral continent by 2050. So I would like really to bring to your attention the importance of the new European Bauhaus because we need you, we need your knowledge, your experience to transform this European Green Deal into a sustainable, a cultural, a profitable for every citizen project. And we need here more of the education community. And the other is don't hesitate to participate in our European uh, Climate for Education Coalition, because I fully believe that we need, we need definitely more opinions, more ideas, you have them. But that was a great pleasure for me. So again, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I hope that soon we'll have the possibility to meet in person, at least really know that the doors of my cabinet are always open for you. Don't hesitate. That will be a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you very much again. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. This interview with EU Commissioner Gabriel has been recorded last week. Many thanks to Her Excellency and her team for making it possible. Now we have the second interview with the Global Head of Public Affairs at Booking.com, Peter Lorbiller, by three law students who won the internal debate competition and Next week, we'll compete in the final of the Hague Inter-University Debate Tournament 2021. Peter? Hello, good afternoon, and sorry for being late. I was no, just no finishing problem. another no. meeting. Hello. Yeah. Hello, thank you. So as you can see, uh, um, the students uh, are ready as well. So as it is uh, uh, something we, we record, for our big event in May. I will start as if yeah, we don't have yet uh, discussed and uh, because yeah, it will be watched by uh, hundreds of students uh, in one month from now. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining for this uh, interview with uh, Mr. Lars Biller, uh, Peter, uh, who is a Global Head of Public Affairs for Booking.com. Uh, 
And together, there are three students, actually, uh, three students who won a tournament in, in, uh, in uh, February at the local level, let's say, but competing as well at the international level. And um, and we wanted to to give them this opportunity to speak with you, Peter, because uh, you have a long experience in uh, in uh, public affairs, in uh, EU affairs as well in general. So I will give a short introduction, and I will ask as well everybody to introduce. But first of all, you, Peter, you have studied in several universities in uh, in in Germany, in France, Sciences Po, for example, in UK, in London Metro. Politan University, Georgetown University in the US, and of course at the College of Bruges uh, in, in, uh, in Belgium, uh, mainly about EU affairs, politics, and then of course you gain experience in Germany, Munich, in Berlin, and then you arrived in uh, 2001 in Brussels, uh, working in a consultancy concerning EU affairs. And uh, now, after working in some companies as well, you are the Global Head of Public Affairs for Booking.com. So thank you again. And, uh, and now I will give as well the floor to the students to, to, to introduce themselves before we start the interview. Uh, Ms. Sarban. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alexandra Sherban. It's a huge pleasure to meet you. Uh, I'm currently in year two uh, of the International European Law program uh, and I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nice to meet you. Uh, yeah. uh, Mr. Uh, Khalil. Uh, hello, sir. My name is uh, Altamash Khalil. I'm from India and as uh, my colleague said, I'm also in second year of international European law at the Hague University and uh, I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to speak with you and have a discussion with you. So really looking forward to it and thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you. Mr. Stumpf. Yes, hello. My name is Martin Stumpf. I'm a fellow countryman of yours. I'm from Germany. <laughs> and um, it's uh, yeah, a pleasure to meet you and to be able to speak with you. Thank you. And I'm also a colleague of um, uh, Mr. Altamash and Ms. Uh, Alexandra. I'm a year two student here. It's my pleasure to, to be here with you today. Thanks for the opportunity. Aurelia has been uh, insistent and over <laughs> years we have tried a few times, sometimes for logistics reasons it hasn't worked out. And, and just to mention, I'm actually close to many of you because although my office is in Amsterdam, I live in The Hague. So um, we could almost have met in person if uh, the circumstances allowed for it. Thank you. Uh, an opportunity to invite you as well in person in the future in our university as well. So uh, now I would like to start with the first questions. Uh, let's say uh, I would like to give the floor especially to the students who wanted to talk about your previous uh, activities as well, um, like Mr. Stumpf, uh, for example, your first question. And after, of course, we'll talk a bit more about uh, Booking.com as well. Yes, so my first question is a relatively general one, just about um, your experience uh, working for Rolls-Royce. I was made aware after the fact that this wasn't the electric car maker division, <laughs> but of course the uh, motor division. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask how your um, position at Rolls-Royce was different from um, the industry that you work in right now, which is more hosp hospitality and uh, travel-based. And um, maybe as a follow-up to that question, seeing as you left Rolls-Royce in 2016, did maybe Brexit impact your work at all? So to, to address that one, Brexit was certainly not the reason for me uh, <laughs> to, to leave uh, Rolls-Royce. There was a, a personal opportunity that, that came up. Um, but I think behind your question is uh, ultimately, I would say, company culture and and that might sometimes uh, sound like an overquoted um, term that is on vogue but you know based on your concrete question my move from Rolls Royce um, to booking.com has shown me indeed how different company cultures can be and um, how they impact also your your day-to-day -day work and this is not judging this is not saying you know one is uh, better than the other it's just very different so looking at Rolls-Royce uh, indeed that is traditionally the, the luxury cars but it is um, the British aero engines and power systems company you know building these fascinating um, 
engines that you have on an Airbus A380 or on the Boeing Dreamliner. Um, so uh, amazing innovation. It's a it's a very traditional, a very engineering driven company. It's a it's a B2B company, right? No no private person will ever buy um, a, a plane engine. Um, and it is uh, also a company in a business that is uh, very much focused on risk because these engines, uh, you know, one bolt breaking in flight can have catastrophic um, results. And statistically, they are uh, luckily extremely rare. But when they happen, and we have seen uh, those over the years, uh, they, they are obviously catastrophic. So I'm, I'm mentioning all of this because this creates a company culture. Um, about what is important and, and what is not so important. Now, if you if you contrast that with with booking, you you know you could argue that it could not be more different. Uh, booking.com is is a very young, diverse, um, tech, agile, and and customer focused um, a company. Also highly innovative in in a very different way. Um, so it was a fascinating transition to move um, from one company to the other. In terms of the, the core of the role of public affairs, um, not everything is different, right? You still deal with uh, legislation in the making, you deal with policy makers, you analyze, you assess, you, you define positions, and you ultimately um, you know, try to, to shape and influence that environment uh, so that it supports the, the strategy of the company. So that doesn't differ, uh, but the, the culture can be uh, very different indeed. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Altomash, you have as well a question about uh, this uh, transition. Uh, thank you for your answer, sir. So, uh, you, you mentioned the point about company culture, and that's quite an important point, as you uh, right, uh, rightly said. My question somewhere uh, revolves around, you know, what actually your work involved in Rolls-Royce and how different it is that you do on a day-to-day -day basis in uh, booking.com. So I'd like to know a bit more about what you day to day, daily on a daily to daily basis do. Yeah. And and that's one clear difference at Rolls Royce. I was uh, a member of an existing global public affairs team and I was focused on uh, EU affairs. I was uh, based in, in the Brussels EU affairs office. Um, at booking, I was recruited um, as the first person ever to even think about how to engage with government stakeholders in a, uh, you know, in a long term and, and structured way. So that, that is different already. I was, I was hired to, to build something from, from scratch, which is, um, is I believe, a, a new unique opportunity. I still feel uh, extremely uh, fortunate having been given that opportunity. Um, and that there are, of course, also differences at Rolls Royce. It was a lot about uh, R&D funding, about um, uh, greening aviation, and um, uh, and generally uh, safety and, and security in aviation. So it's it's different topics. Um, at, at Booking, it's a very diverse range of topics. Happy to go into more detail later, maybe. But as a company that is literally operating in every corner of this world, either because we have customers who book from there or because we have um, uh, accommodation and other business partners operating in these countries. So the, the potential um, volume of, of issues that could impact us and that we could aim to influence is huge. And that requires at the end of the day, a very, very targeted um, focused approach to filter what can have potentially the biggest impact and basically where do we um, invest our resources in. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stumpf as well, you have a second question in general more about uh, public affairs as well uh, in Brussels. Uh, yes, um, this is more generally about your um, positions, having worked at several um, uh, businesses, advised several businesses and um, public affairs capacities uh, to the EU and several of them. And um, so I just wanted to ask if you think that Brussels um, is too susceptible to external in interest representation um, or what your perspective is possibly on uh, public affairs in Brussels. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make a slightly bold statement maybe, but I will say that to me, the European Union is the most transparent and accessible political system that I know of. 
Um, I think it's it's leading by example in many ways in terms of the consultation processes, the the um, how, how accessible decision makers are in the European Commission, in the Parliament, on the Council side, and um, I I truly believe that input from practice, from the real world, if you want, is crucial in order to make regulation practical and effective and also enforceable at the end of the day, because it is often the companies or, or other organizations who have to implement and, and comply with laws. And for that, it, it is absolutely necessary to, um, to have that process. Um, and then, of course, there is always a discussion who, you know, is, is there a bias towards uh, business input versus uh, civil society? Um, you know, I, I am a believer at the end of the day that elected politicians will do their job and their job is listening to everyone and, um, you know, finding compromises and filtering where, where the truth, uh, so to say, lies. Um, I, I also do believe that civil society over the years um, has gained influence and, and have their voice. Um, and, and ultimately, I, yeah, I, I hope that it is a competition for who brings the best arguments in terms of facts and evidence-based um, public affairs or interest representation, where, of course, relationships matter, but they are not sufficient. If you don't have, you know, factual, actionable input to bring to the table, um, I don't think in the year 2021, you stand much of a chance in Brussels or elsewhere to actually influence things. So things have evolved over the past 20, 30 years, um, where the kind of good old lobbying of who knows whom and open stores um, is, I think, in many ways the past, and it is a competition for, for the best arguments. Thank you. Uh, there is a question which is as well about your activity on digital diplomacy. Uh, Mr. Altamash Khalil, you had a question because of course it's important as well to be active on LinkedIn. Um, yes. Um, so actually I was going through your LinkedIn profile, which I must say I was quite inspired by. It was really wonderful to go through all your experiences. And I uh, stumbled, uh, stumbled upon digital diplomacy, which you have kind of added as a new thing uh, to your bio, I believe. So I, I was curious what, you know, how it actually plays a role in your field of work and how has it really developed uh, in, in this, you know, pandemic era? Yeah, that's an, an excellent question. Um, to, 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 to go one, one level up, maybe I, you know, the, the internet has revolutionized many aspects of, of our lives. I think that uh, that, that is a, a no-brainer. Um, but that includes the way in which we follow news, in which we consume um, yeah, newspapers and, and, and other sources, um, how we research. Um, I'm sure that the way you research your papers and draft your papers is, uh, you know, while I don't feel old, I think there will be a big difference to the way I did that when I was studying mostly in the you know 90s uh, and early 2000s. So it, it has revolutionized uh, many, uh, many ways. And it has also revolutionized uh, policy making. Um, policy making has become faster paced. It is happening a lot more in public, like out there on, on Twitter. Um, as a fellow German, I was just following the, the discussions about who would become the, the chancellor candidate among the, the Christian Democrats. Uh, that was very much in public, like everything becomes public immediately. Um, and, and there are lively online discussions ongoing on, on Twitter and elsewhere among policymakers, where policymakers get input from academia and elsewhere. And if you want to be, if you want to, to shape legislation, and, and that is the ambition uh, I, I have when I run a, a public affairs function for, for a global company, then you have to be present on these channels. Now, at Booking.com, we started um, only very recently with this. I think many practitioners are still absent from this space. Uh, to make it concrete, we started to have a, uh, a blog for public affairs dedicated to policy issues. We also then started a, a Twitter channel. 
um, where we, you know, push our positions, but where we can also react and retweet and, and comment on other things and, and share, etc. Uh, so that, that is very concretely something that, that is out there that is also publicly accessible. Um, and then I would just add a, a second dimension to uh, digital diplomacy. You could call it equally digital public affairs, digital uh, advocacy. To me, these are the same terms. And the, the second area is um, how you use data for your public affairs. Because there is a, you know, a wealth of things that, that we can tap into. Um, to, to give one example, maybe that was related to the launch of our Twitter channel, you can do fascinating uh, network analysis, uh, kind of finding out who influences whom, who follows whom, and then you can find clusters of people and can sort of indirectly, you know, reach the people that you know um, uh, can, can influence uh, others. So, um, yeah, I, I think in, in 2021, it's, uh, it's not a nice to have. I, I would say it's an indispensable element of a, you know, of, a, of an um, impactful public affairs strategy. But I do admit at Booking, we're still in the early days, but we're making quick steps and it's a, it's a fascinating area. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, several questions, uh, which are particularly about Booking.com from Ms. Charban. So Ms. Charban, could you, talk a bit more about maybe the question with consumer protection, consumer law? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Um, recently, there has been a press release um, about Booking.com committing to align uh, practices, presenting offers and prices with the EU law, um, and that is following EU action. Uh, EU um, has imposed that Booking.com had to make changes to the way it functions under EU law. Uh, and that uh, change, the changes that had to be made were made up to the June 2020, so which is not even a year ago. Um, at the moment, what is the status of Booking.com's compliance with the, the high EU consumer standards? Uh, absolutely. I, I see you have done your, your research. There were two pieces. There was indeed uh, some changes to consumer rules. There was also the platform to business regulation that came into force at the EU level. Um, generally speaking, um, companies such as Booking.com, we're not the only ones. There are other price comparison sites, online booking platforms. They have no doubt brought you know, a huge amount of transparency to this market of online travel booking. Um, most of you are, are too young probably to even remember that. But uh, I mean, if you go back to, to my uh, childhood or teenager years, how you booked travel, it was literally looking at a paper catalog that was printed once a year. And, you know, if you look at the level of transparency that you had with that, when um, Tui or Thomas Cook or Neckerman or whoever, you know, presented a hotel as a, uh, you know, the location, uh, there, there were certain terms that I don't remember, but they, they kind of in secret, everyone knew that meant it was next to a motorway, but the description has sounded like uh, it, it's a beautiful location. Whereas today, you you know, you go to Google Maps, you, you have descriptions, you have customer reviews. So generally speaking, I think huge amount of um, transparency has, has come to the market and has made it easier for consumers to find toys, uh, great prices, uh, and also a safe and secure uh, online uh, booking experience. And um, legislation evolves and at booking, we, we absolutely want to be, and I would claim broadly are at the forefront of uh, being, you know, having the customer at the center of everything we do. Um, we want people to not come once and do a booking and then have a bad experience and never come back. We want to build lifelong uh, relationships, if you want, and, and build really long-term uh, value out of customers. So th therefore, we, we absolutely support um, steps that, uh, that, that improve transparency. Now, sometimes it's a matter of interpreting the law, right? The law is not always 100% crystal clear, and interpretation can also differ from one country to another, be it within Europe or be it you know, between Europe or the US or Asia, also customer preferences can differ quite a bit. Um, and, you know, and, and sometimes we make uh, mistakes. We don't always get it wrong, but we will certainly always have the ambition uh, to, to correct it and, and learn fast. 
And, and then the other thing to mention is that the regulatory environment evolves and, and we adapt to it. So I think it's, it's not a static process. Uh, it's, this is where my conviction comes back that public affairs is, is ideally a dialogue. It's not a one way road, but it's staying in contact and, and sharing experiences uh, and, and work towards, uh, you know, a good regulatory environment that, uh, that works for, for everyone. In, in terms of just to, to finish off concretely the, the platform to business regulation, uh, that, that is fully implemented. We had that ready on the day that it became applicable. Um, it was relatively minor changes that we had to do, which is a good sign to see that the company is at the forefront and then such a new regulation can eliminate uh, poor practices in the market, which we are all um, in, in favor of. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I may continue um, with yes. the follow up question, you mentioned mistakes that sometimes are made um, and obviously the conclusions that are being drawn from it. Um, it is also being released on the March 2021 that the Dutch Data Protection Authority had a decision that imposed a fine on Booking.com is because uh, almost uh, half a, a million of uh, euro, and that was arisen from the delays in reporting a data breach incident. Despite the fact that um, this incident happened in 2018, uh, the news still keep on going on about it and keep um, promoting the fact that okay, Booking.com has indeed been imposed a fine on. Um, could you tell us what actions did Booking.com take since then to enhance its data protection? Yeah, and indeed that was uh, in the in the Dutch uh, media. Um, so let, let me start by saying that um, at Booking we we believe very much in respecting everyone's privacy and ensuring that everyone's data is is secure. People entrust important data, whether it's credit card details or building up a uh, you know, a, a login profile with your past travels, etc. Um, so it, it is a cornerstone on, on which our business is founded um, that uh, individuals trust us with, with the privacy and security of the data and thereby, therefore we, we invest uh, heavily in, in these areas. Also in fraud detection and compliance with, uh, with privacy laws to, to keep our customers data safe. Um, on the concrete case, um, indeed, um, that, that goes back to 2018, I believe. Um, it was a relatively small uh, social engineering attack. As a globally operating company, we are you know, obviously exposed to those, like every online company. It was an attack on, on our partners. And this shows you the complexity of this interconnected uh, you know, digitally interwoven world that there can be so many access points and that, that shows the, the need to, to invest heavily. Now, we took swift action uh, back then to inform um, affected customers. Uh, we, we got that right. And, and, and the one point I want to emphasize, that's my, my key point, the fine that we got from the Dutch authority was for the fact that we reported this incident late to the authority. So this is what the fine is about, and rightly so. There are rules about that. We were late with reporting that. Um, in terms of uh, learnings, I, I don't think there are specific kind of actions from this case other than, you know, reporting within the deadlines that are, that are set by the uh, GDPR. But it is very much an ongoing effort, a daily investment. We have full teams working on uh, on security and privacy all the time. So um, what, what I want to say is that we did not necessarily need a wake up call to this fine, but this independent of the outcome of this investigation has always been and continues to be uh, a top priority. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Harbon, you have as well a question, I think concerning, um, let's say, uh, public funds as well, tourism during the pandemic, of course. Yes, thank you. Um... Again, referring to uh, some research that has been done, uh, you have posted on your Twitter that tourism businesses are paying a high price for the slow rollout of the vaccination in, in response to a tweet by Financial Times. And um, as I've been um, looking at through the news that the Booking.com indeed has uh, had a certain level of criticism for uh, asking for government aid uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and later on, they decided to lay off about 25% of its global workforce. Um, so as a future question, is Booking.com 
planning to further rely on government aid in the pan if the pandemic is persisting, of course, or uh, do you plan to continue dismissing uh, the employees? The, the travel and tourism industry is beyond any doubt among the hardest hit sectors by this extended COVID-19 crisis that we are seeing. And this is, this is terrible for, for many businesses. It, it's most terrible for, for the small businesses, for the restaurants, for the family-owned hotels who literally were forced to stay shut for, for months and months and months. If you look at booking.com and um, if, if you understand the, the business model that we are in, our revenue stream is uh, a commission model that we earn from hotels when we bring them guests. That implies when we do not bring them guests, we do not earn a cent, um, which means early uh, last year when all the border restrictions came in, we had uh, massive waves of cancellations, uh, a lot of efforts to deal with them, uh, but we had no income basically. Um, now to share one number from our earnings call uh, on the full year of, of 2020, um, our gross booking, so that the bookings that, that came in uh, were down by 63% 2020 compared to 2019. Our total revenue was down 55%. Uh, net income, so our profits, was down by 99%, um, which are dramatic numbers. Um, and obviously, a company needs to adjust the cost base when the business breaks away in, in such a dramatic, uh, to, to such a dramatic extent. And after you have got marketing and travel and other operational costs, there's unfortunately no way to avoid adjusting also the number of employees because that is uh, the core of, of who we are, the, the colleagues and uh, you know the, the brain and the commitment they, they bring to the company. Um, so that there was just not enough work for everyone in the company. This was a tough decision. I think it's the toughest decision anyone can do. And indeed, we we uh, we had to reduce our workforce by a uh, little less than the 25% overall. Um, and in this context, then um, we decided to um, to also apply for subsidies that the Dutch government um, made available for companies that were in such a dramatic situation of the business literally breaking away. So we applied for that sometime April last year, I believe. And at that point, the situation was even harder to predict. No one knew at that time how long would that situation um, continue. And we are extremely grateful to the Dutch government uh, for those uh, NOV subsidies, as, as they're called in Dutch. Because of what they did, they bought us time, basically. They bought us time to make better informed and more measured decisions because we got that for a period of three months in total. Um, and, and so we could take more measured decisions than maybe we would have taken if we had to react uh, in the situation about how many uh, layoffs uh, we, we were forced to do. Um, so we, we received that subsidies for uh, three months in 2020. We decided not to apply for the extension of the program because at that point we thought we had a clearer picture where this sector was heading. Um, and we now look to the future with, uh, with optimism. We are still in a very difficult situation in Europe. But if you look towards the UK or a little further to the US, um, I think it's very clear that once vaccination rollout um, happens fast, people want to travel again. There is this pent up demand. Uh, I have it. Um, I, I assume some of you will have it. Um, and this is why this, this has been a, a tough year. It will continue to be a difficult 2021. But we are well prepared as booking, uh, you know, to be ready when demand comes back. And we will obviously do our part also to channel that demand, whatever demand is available, to bring that to our partners and to support these small and medium sized uh, hotels that we can bring guests to them um, because they are clearly in a situation of, uh, of survival. There's, there's no doubt. Sure. Uh, another question, two other questions, Ms. Savan, about working in a, in a company like Booking.com. Thank you. Yes. Um, 
speaking like right now about the way you handle um the situation that has been going on with uh, covid um and having advised multinational corporations from various sectors from the point of view of an employee why would you choose booking.com over any other company how is the work ethic any different from uh, a company in the same field like as an example kayak and I've been five years now with booking. So in a way I am uh, proof that at least some people like myself see a uh, value of, of staying at, at booking. Now we, we have based on what I said before, we have had to say farewell to more colleagues than we wished over the past months. And the, the one theme that, that really shines through all those farewell messages from, from colleagues who, who lost their jobs, which, which is, you know, a, a sad and, and difficult situation for each individual. But the one theme that stands out is uh, that these colleagues who had to leave, they emphasize how special the people are at booking. And I know that might sound like, a, you know, like a cliche um, that, that every company says about themselves. But I, I do believe there is something uh, about the, the people at booking. It's very smart people, um, very diverse. In our headquarters in Amsterdam, we have, I think, more than 120 nationalities represented. So it's truly global and diverse and open-minded. I think there is a, a very collaborative approach that people truly want to work together and want to focus on, on finding solutions together and not one department working against the other. Um, and, and that is reflected in the, the, the values that, that we have. There's a value of uh, owning it, so taking responsibility and accountability, not shying away from that. Um, we have a value of think customer first, um, so be very customer centric. But you could also apply that to kind of um, internal customers, right? Customers, not necessarily always the person booking, but that can also be a, an internal stakeholder. Um, and succeed together, learn forever, doing the right thing. So these are the corporate values that I believe reflect that. Um, and that is, uh, certainly speaking for myself, um, a, a culture that uh, that I'm very happy with. Um, you, you, you asked about Kayak. Kayak is actually a, a sister company of ours. Kayak um, belongs to Booking Holdings. Um, but I, I, I can't speak for, for others, really. I made before the comparison between a previous employer, Rolls-Royce, and, and booking right now. Um, but I, I leave it here, you know, talking about what I know something about. That is the, the company that I work for, uh, but not, uh, not speculating about others. Thank you. Um, and following up with that, um, giving such a great reputation to booking.com and uh, showing us your own example. When it comes to well, finally the pandemic passing and potential young employees like me and my colleagues age group uh, of booking.com, would you say that the company is primarily basing its decision as an example on grades that we receive on bachelor's and master's straight stage of education? Or uh, are you basing yourself on critical thinking and the ability to blend in the collective? So um, just to give us hope. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we do continue to have open positions, right? So we have done a restructuring, but um, you know, we have a growth journey ahead. There are open positions. So I definitely encourage you to, uh, to look at our, our careers website. Um, now, great matter. Um, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, we're not looking at, at degrees and, and certificates. And I think they matter because they give an indication of whether a person has proven to be able to work in an academic manner. Uh, what I mean is analyzing complexity, um, right pieces, you know, thought pieces in a, in a consistent and precise way, like, you know, with as many words as required, but also as few as possible to, to get to the point. Um, and I, I do believe these are things that one learns in an, in an academic university program. Um, and I would not, not brush, um, those are way as kind of old school um, skills that you can entirely replace by, uh, by, other, by, by, by other skills. But then also I believe at the end of the day, it is the personality 
that matters most? Uh, is someone the right fit into a team, into a role, into a company? Does this person have the, the critical thinking, um, et cetera? So yes, grades matter. They're an indication for certain things, but um, I would then always want to um, test those values and uh, and abilities in, in real life and certainly not blindly um, rely on, on grades only. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stum, if you have a question as well concerning uh, what is lobbying and as well a uh, comparison with uh, the German parliament in, in Brussels. Yes, we only briefly have to return to the issue of lobbying because you've already uh, kind of expressed your viewpoint on transparency and that you championed that. But um, this might be interesting because uh, I wanted to ask you what your opinion is on European government's efforts um, who have been trying to uh, curb uh, lobbying uh, and external interest representation. And this is might be especially interesting in the context of the German parliament just a month or two ago, um, recently introducing a, a mandatory lobby registry in Berlin. And um, my original question was, do such efforts stifle the democratic process or not go enough? But I assume that uh, your answer will go one way rather than the other. I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. I mean, I think that the German decision has come very late. Again, if you compare that to the EU level, now the, the EU transparency register is not perfect, but it has been around for years and years, and it gives at least a, you know, a good level of transparency. Um, and, and as you rightly assume, I'm, I'm fully in favor of, of transparency and lobby registers. I do not believe that uh, a lobby register um, curbs external interest, interest representation. I think it's a matter of, of how you do interest representation. Um, and registers create a level of transparency and, and thereby separate those who compete for the best argument, as I said before, which I would say is my understanding of modern 21st century uh, style public affairs. So separate those from others who hope to do deals behind closed doors. And I'm not even going to recent examples in Germany about uh, you know, side deals that uh, elected members of parliament uh, did, which is absolutely morally unacceptable. And in my view has nothing to do with public affairs. I need to defend my, my profession here a little bit. So transparency about who meets whom and spends how much budget on PA does not go against um, democratic participation at all um, to the to the contrary in, entirely. It's it's a good thing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stumpf, you had as well a question uh, about an article uh, which was written about the WEF, the World Economic Forum as well. Yes, this is just to briefly address the um, idea of corporate social responsibility because um, I recall that you wrote an article for the World Economic Forum uh, which addressed that um, uh, global businesses and uh, globalization do play a part in the development of local economies. And uh, I remember you saying that they should therefore also accept more uh, local responsibility. And so I wanted to ask you and how far you think the uh, broader idea of corporate social responsibility may have a future in business regulation, um, possibly even at the European level. And I also realize now that I forgot to tie um, booking.com into this question. So maybe as a follow up to that question, uh, maybe mm -hmm. your thoughts on, um, in the context of Booking.com, what the uh, company um, has done um, in regard to this uh, broader idea. Yeah, and indeed that that article was in the it, it was kind of applied to the travel and tourism uh, sector, which generates around ten percent of global GDP, and in many countries it is a much higher share. Those that depend strongly on uh, on inbound tourism in terms of jobs creation. So. Um, and a large share of that economic benefit actually stays in the destination with all the small local businesses in, in the ecosystem. Um, so tourism is, is of huge importance for, for many regions. The, the question then is, how do you manage tourism in a way that it minimizes negative effects and maximizes the, the positives? And before COVID-19, there were um, there was a growing discussion about over tourism in certain destinations like Barcelona or, or, or uh, Dubrovnik or, or elsewhere. Um, now, I think right now, many people would regard that as a bit of a luxury um, 
discussion to have. They would uh, probably be happy to, to welcome anyone. But still, um, I think there's an opportunity here to, um, you know, that the term has been created about build back better uh, to, to avoid to repeat mistakes um, of the past. Lo looking at booking, I would definitely say, and also beyond booking, I would definitely say that awareness and interest for sustainability and, and being a good corporate citizen um, in terms of uh, governance and environment and, and societal impact, um, all that is, is growing. There is no doubt about that. Um, and especially among shareholders and investors as well. So we, we have um, you know, active conversations around that. Um, if you look at the, the funds that the European Union is making available for recovery, I think there are two big themes that run through that. That is greening and, and digitizing um, the economy. Um, and I think ultimately then what, what is important is that you move beyond running programs on the side of the core business and really integrate sustainability slash CSR slash ESG, integrate it into, into your product. Now, if you look at um, at Booking, we have run um, a sustainability program program for many years. We have um, allowed our employees to um, to spend a certain amount of time. Um, you know, sometimes it's cleaning up the beach, sometimes it's helping out a local NGO, etc. Um, and and we continue that. But what we are now doing is really looking at where can we have the biggest impact. And I think the biggest impact is really building sustainability into your core product. In our case, that will be something like a sustainability filter or a tag where we can allow consumers to make conscious choices, allow them to consciously pick a hotel that, you know, according to certain standards and indicators is more sustainable than another. I think this is um, where, where businesses can have the, the, the the longest lasting and most sustainable impact. Um, that doesn't mean that efforts to become um, energy neutral in your own operations doesn't is not meaningful, but I think the, the kind of leverage effect comes by building it closer into your core product. All right, thank you. This also sort of ties into the follow-up question that I wanted to ask, which is, um, and uh, uh, do you think that corporations are actually becoming more socially responsible and taking steps uh, in, in doing so? Or do they uh, just embrace the idea of it because it sounds good from a public uh, relations angle? And I'm aware of the kind of cynical nature of this, um, how to cross this question. But um, yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to be overly idealistic. We have certainly seen a level of greenwashing and companies running uh, CSR projects on the side to counterbalance maybe negative effect they have elsewhere. Um, but I do believe there's a learning that um, in order to have lasting impact and in order to be credible with what, we, with, with what you do as a company, um, I don't really want to pick examples, but you know, uh, being in, 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 in oil and gas and then planting trees on the side, I don't think is, uh, you know, the, the modern and latest understanding of CSR. So there I come back to building it into the core of, of your product. So yes, for sure, there is some PR effect and, um, and, and companies want to see recognition, but I do believe there is a clear trend um, to, to enshrine sustainability in, in your operations. And I think it's unavoidable and it's, it's a good thing. Thank you very much. Mr. Altomash Khalil, you have a last question as well. Um, yes, I do. So listening to all of this, to you, the way you describe uh, your work, it, it is evident to all of us right now that's really challenging. And from that, I'm really curious to know what, what do you think is the most essential trait that one should have in your line of work. And line of work meaning public affairs, interest representation. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. So 
a few things come to my mind, um, and they are not necessarily um, linked directly to to my profession. So maybe I will disappoint you with my answer. Um, but I would say curiosity. It might sound banal, but I don't think it is um, for people to keep the curiosity to be eager to learn and understand new things and look at them, you know, from all perspectives in a kind of 360 um, degree. Um, I, I think that that basic, basically human nature, children have it, right? Every child is curious. They want to learn. They want to understand. They ask questions until you're tired of them. I have, I have two uh, kids of three and six years. I'm, I'm speaking from experience. Uh, so curiosity is, is a trait that I have found to be um, really important for people to to grow and to um, you know to 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 look beyond their their, their role today. Um, but maybe then a second one, a little closer to to the public affairs profession, is the ability to to build trust. Um, if you ask me for one key word in my profession, you know what matters, it's trust. If you represent a company or an organization or an NGO or a government and and you bring forward your arguments, but people don't trust you that you are, you know, genuine and 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 coming in good faith, uh, that then you have a problem. Now, people of course will always know that when I meet a politician, I'm there to represent booking.com not our direct competitor, not, uh, um, I don't know, others. So that, that's obvious and that brings it back to transparency then, right? To be very clear about who and what you represent. But the ability to, to build trust and, and build relationships on, on that basis, I think is, is really at the core of public affairs. And, and related to that then is, is getting buy-in, right? Um, you, you, you want to have impact, you want to, to shape things. Uh, but I think it's related. If if you don't have trust, um, you will not um, get people to buy into your ideas. So that that's related. So maybe that was a little more on the soft skills side than than the hard skills. But the, these are things that come to my mind about um, really essential um, qualities um, that that people need need to bring. Thank you. So, so now, these are my questions as well. I will give you a bit of context. It's because we are creating a master program in public affairs, global mm -hmm. public affairs, not focused just on Brussels, but as well in Berlin, London, etc. And there are some key questions that uh, we need to translate as well into documents. And, and we want to, to share as well with, uh, with the colleagues and as well with external. So in, 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 you already answered the first question, which is about your definition of what is public affairs. And now, what would be, let's say, in general, the skills or the background, like uh, usually what do they study? I mean, uh, uh, public affairs professionals before entering that uh, career. And, uh, and indeed, uh, which kind of behavior you mentioned curiosity, but is there something else like on language or some aspects which can play as well a role about it? Yeah, no, I, I definitely have some, some more ideas and maybe more on, on the side of hard skills, if you want. I don't think that's a kind of black and white distinction, soft skills, hard skills. But I mean, for sure, you need to have a solid understanding of political decision-making processes um, in theory and in practice. So on the theory, I think this is where some legal elements come in and political science um, and a bit of uh, sociology maybe, but also in practice. Um, question then is, do you build that through internships, through practical experience on the side or through, uh, you know, things like the UN um, model, uh, I forgot the exact United Nations. Yes, uh, thank you. So a kind of negotiation um, exercises, uh, Oxford debating style. Um, and, and there we're moving to the soft skills already. I think it's, um, yeah, what, what I described before as Critical thinking, connected, multi-dimensional thinking, uh, and and then public speaking and negotiation skills. It is it is a people's business, at least mostly. I mean, you can be an analyst that stays on the background. I think that's also possible. Someone who is highly analytical and and you know maybe not the, the most extrovert. I think there are rules for everyone in in this uh, in this field, but typically people would be the ones 
to go out and meet people and make their case. And this is where I think negotiation and, and public speaking comes uh, comes in as well. Thank you. And now you have studied in different uh, institutions uh, in different countries, and now you work in public affairs for several years, many years as well. Um, which kind of course you think could be in a university in order to, to train or to open minds immediately for public affairs? Even if you study in political science or communication or law, is there something, let's say, which could be added to a curriculum, for example? So, um... Yeah, I've been in this field for, for 20 years and, and that was not necessarily always clear. I think if you had asked me during my university years about the kind of the dream role, probably at the time it would have been either an official in the European Commission, so an EU uh, civil servant, or maybe German um, foreign service, uh, diplomatic service. Now, things turned out different because I found that that very exciting spot that I still um, you know, that, that still makes me go to work and it is working um, on that interface, on, on that junction where politics and business and society meet and, and where uh, things get, get figured out. Um, the, the one thing that, if I look back at my own journey, that probably I could have benefited from, from having done more um, is business basics. Um, so, I don't think you need a fully fledged business or MBA degree, but an understanding of um, how private sector works, how market economy works, including finance, um, how to explain value creation in order to also be able to explain and, and monetize in a way the value that you create in a public affairs role. This is what I didn't have much of, and I, I can maybe add a, a quick anecdote to that. I did a number of internships during my during my studies, ranging from um, kind of government offices to trade union offices. But then, kind of in the middle of my my first degree, I I did a bold move, and and I I applied out of the blue to some of the big um, management consultancies. And I was lucky enough to land a, a summer fellowship with uh, McKinsey at the time. It was a, a huge steep learning curve um, because I really didn't have much understanding of, of private business. The anecdote that I want to tell, um, and it will show you how, how much I was lacking that, that business acumen. In my application letter to McKinsey, I think I, I wrote something like, you know, would be uh, an honor and great experience to, um, to, to work for a corporation or conglomerate such as McKinsey. Now, a consulting firm like McKinsey, the last thing they want to be described that is a conglomerate. <laughs> um, but despite that, I was lucky enough to, to get that summer fellowship, but it's the anecdote just to show you that I was not very literate in business terms and I had to learn it. And looking back, I would encourage you know all of you uh, to do that, either as part of a program or out of your own initiative. There are so many online opportunities uh, that basis understanding on, on how business functions. Thank you. And uh, it will be my next question, but I want to reflect as well. Uh, uh, when I was working in public affairs uh, years ago in, in, in Brussels for another company, indeed, uh, uh, as we are between public sector and private sector constantly, uh, sometimes we have to, to use the jargon of uh, indeed the business sector. And it's something sometimes, uh, yeah, we are not very sure because, uh, yeah, we are used to the public sector uh, jargon most of the time, but, but indeed it's something which, uh, if we have both, uh, that can help a lot. So now uh, my last question is, uh, of course, for the students and everybody watching, we are in a year of pandemic. Uh, there have been a lot of stress for the students uh, studying at home, taking exams at home as well, and not being able to travel or to meet their professors sometimes. So which kind of advice you could give uh, to the students uh, during this period of, let's say we hope, end of pandemic period, uh, just for them as well to, to think about uh, how it would be next year as well for the job market, for, for example. Yeah, I, I probably can't even imagine how, how tough this past year, this past 12 months must have been for many of you, for all of you. Um, I have a, a nephew of mine who is at, at university, so I've got so, some insights from him there. But, um, you know, it, it's not 
advice, but just to say all my respect and, and chapeau for, for what you have all gone through. Because in, in the public discussion, we often quickly jump to family situations and, you know, parents having to work from home when schools were closed. And no doubt that was challenging, but there are so many other personal situations of people feeling lonely and maybe having arrived in a city. I, I've heard of colleagues who came to Amsterdam from Brazil or India in February last year, not knowing anyone, hoping on, you know, getting to know colleagues and, and making that the core of, of their life. And that just didn't work and because we were, we were stuck at home. So, um, again, so just my respect for you to, to go through that. Um, I'm sure there were dreams and plans that had fallen through, maybe internships that were planned, maybe exchange programs that were planned, and maybe delays in, in programs. Um, turning to, you know, to the more positive outlook, I, I do believe we see the end of the tunnel. And it's a lot of back and forth, and uh, you know we see the the very positive news in the U.S. with the rollout of vaccination. Um, we see, on the contrary, uh, countries like India or others that are in a in a very dire situation. But also in Europe, we are not through this yet. But I think we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So um, the the only kind of last word I would have is, you know, try to stay positive. Uh, seek the opportunities. There are opportunities. If I look at my profession, there are many companies, especially in the more tech area and fintechs and the, you know, the scale ups that are investing in policy and that increasingly see the need and the value from that function. So there are definitely opportunities out there. Uh, so yeah, seek them, look out for them and, and stay positive. I, I guess that's, uh, the only kind of advice that, that I have to, to share. Yes, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you as well on behalf of uh, the university and the students, uh, because it's indeed a particular year. We are organizing Foodie Online, this uh, event, and, uh, and the students, they need to hear as well from the profession uh, some, some, uh, some words as well to, to know, yeah, that it will go better, obviously, for them as well. So thank you again. Uh, thank you for your time as well. And, uh, and we hope for the best and we hope to invite you in person in the future as well uh, in our building. Thank you again. Pleasure. Thanks very much. All the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 As a tradition of ENEs, time to give the floor to two of the 850 Zieg University law alumni around the world and their message and advice to the law students. Miss Maria Hernandez from London and Mr. Gian Erdogan from Rotterdam. Hi everyone, my name is Maria Hernandez and I graduated from The Hague University in 2018. I am currently working as the Protection Officer for a junior sports group here in London in the UK. I am extremely honored to have been invited to be a speaker in this year's ENE edition. I myself have participated in many years before, uh, but as a student. And I can't recommend it highly enough for all the students that are looking for their first professional experience. It's a unique opportunity for you to meet employers and network. Um, so my advice for you is take as much advantage of the event um, as you possibly can. A little bit about myself, I am originally Brazilian. I moved to The Hague in 2014 to start my studies at The Hague University in International and European Law. On my third year of law school, I chose to specialize in commercial law. It was at that time that I participated in the International Commercial Arbitration um, Vismut competition. Um, this is where my interest in international arbitration started. I ultimately went on to get a master's degree in investment treaty arbitration at Uppsala University in Sweden. But funny enough, none of my professional experiences have been actually in the field of um, arbitration. All of my professional experiences have been in data protection and privacy compliance. Um, so here's a bit of advice for you. Um, keep an open mind as to what you plan on doing uh, career-wise. I um, got my first internship in data protection and I absolutely loved it. Um, and I had no idea that I actually enjoyed data protection and privacy before my internship. So when looking for opportunities, don't restrict yourself 
um, keep an open mind because you may find that you enjoy other fields of law that you wouldn't have otherwise considered if you weren't for your professional experience. Um, so I did my first internship at Airbus Defense and Space in Leiden. I then went on during my fourth year um, at the Hay University. I got an internship in Vienna at the Sport Radar Group, where I also worked with privacy compliance. After my master's, I moved to London to work um, in privacy and data protection compliance at a utilities company. And last year, I joined Junior Sports Group as privacy manager. And as of November last year, I was appointed data protection officer for the group of companies. Um, it's been, you know, it, it, it wasn't planned. I didn't plan to, to go into data protection, but um, ultimately loads of opportunities um, popped up and I just kept an open mind and, and, and took um, the opportunities that came my way. So that's my advice for you when looking um, is to keep an open mind and um, don't restrict your, your career journey to a specific interest um, because you may find yourself um, interested in different fields of law. I also, during my time at the Hague University, I co-founded and co-created alongside Ana Maria Banova and Mr. Larange um, the Hague Debate Tournament, uh, which is a competition um, in which the participants get to debate um, topics of law. Um, this year, we're already um, going to be starting a new edition. Um, so it's been uh, ongoing since we started and um, it was an extremely valuable and enriching extracurricular activity. So another piece of advice for you is if you can participate in extracurricular activities, um, do so. Um, it really adds to you both academically and you take experiences from it that you can carry over professionally as well. Um, without further ado, um, all I want to say is I wish you the best of luck um, in your studies. I wish the best of luck in your professional career. Keep in mind not to compare yourself to others, um, you know, build your own journey. And if you have any questions or you'd like to get in touch with me, you can find me on LinkedIn um, as Maria Hernandez. Wishing you a great e and &E and we'll be in touch. Dear students and members of the law faculty, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Lorange for providing me this opportunity to speak at the 10th anniversary of this employment network event. My name is Gian Erdogan and I work as a lawyer at Van Dorne in the European and Competition Law Department. Van Dorne is a leading full service independent Dutch law firm with offices located in Amsterdam as well as in London. So what is it that I do in the European and Competition Law Department together with my team? Basically, we are advising our clients in legal matters in relation to European law and competition law in particular. For example, we could get a question regarding the cartel prohibition or state aid or also the abuse of dominant position. But also, we draft tailor fit contracts for our clients which is in line with competition rules. So that is in a nutshell what I do today. However, a lot of hard work and dedication lies behind this journey that I went through to come to this point where I stand today. Therefore, I would like to look back in time and talk you through where I started and talk a little bit about my educational background. And also, I would like to give you some advice uh, which you may find useful. For me, it started in 2012, where I enrolled in this international European law program provided by the Hague University of Applied Sciences. I think the law program provided by the Hague University is absolutely an added value for you in order to grasp the necessary legal knowledge on different areas of law on the international European level. Also, the projects that you're working on enables you to develop on your soft skills, which you can put into practice in your future career. So after my graduation in 2016, I studied further at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. I did my second bachelor's degree in Dutch law, and subsequently I did my master's degree in corporate law uh, there as well. So after I finished my master's degree at the Erasmus University, I did some legal internships at large law firms, 
And after that, I started my career at Fandorna. So what is the message I would like to share with you? If you aspire to work at a big law firm such as Fandorna, I suggest you start working on your CV. Because your CV is really important, the first thing that your future employee is going to look at is your CV. Therefore, I would like to advise you to do some extracurricular activities next to your studies. That could vary from personal hobbies to do some volunteer work or also to do some legal internship as I did in the past. Because these extracurricular activities show a little bit about yourself. It shows who you are or what you're capable of. And that is something that your future employees interest at. It is also great to have some good results at your studies, but bear in mind that not only the results will make the difference when you apply for a job, also the extracurricular activities play an important role at your future employer. My second advice to you is that already try to think about the steps that you're going to take after you have graduated. As you well know, we are in this COVID situation and it's a good idea to orientate on your future career. Try to ask yourself the simple question, where will I stand five years from now? Are you going to study further or are you going to apply for a job? And if you're going to apply for a job, my advice to you is that find a person uh, in the field that you're interested to work and ask him the simple question, uh, what are the requirements to apply for the same job as you do? Or what are the expectations of your employer? In that sense, you will try to put for yourself certain goals and check for yourself whether you already fulfill these requirements or the expectations. And if not, try to set for yourself aims and goals and try to work towards it. Let Corona not be a barrier for your future career, but instead let it be a challenge and try to find some creative ideas to overcome this challenge. With that being said, I would like to thank all of you for listening. I wish you good luck with your studies and stay healthy. Here is the end of the ceremony of the Employee Network event 2021, the 10th anniversary. Ik wil graag een paar woorden zeggen in een taal die ik al lang geleden had moeten leren. Ik ben zeer dankbaar voor de kansen die ik heb gekregen in Nederland en niet bijzonder van, het, van de Axor School om vele projecten te ontwikkelen en organiseren waarvan er het Employee Network Event is en Bannemarkt die haar tiens editie is morgen vieren. Ten eerste zou ik graag al mijn studenten onder wie wel alumni willen bedanken. Die mijn Frans accent hebben overleefd zonder te veel schade aan een vermogen om te luisteren op te lopen. De Udir en de assistenten onderaan, dit nu en ook, zij zijn nog in orde. Wel dank aan mijn collega en de decan, Lidwin Bremer, die mijn e-mails ontvinden om 6 uur en de ochtends. Wel dank aan Unju voor het Vergezellen op diverse trips om het werk dat wij voor de studenten doen te verder worden en te presenteren. Wel dank aan Esther voor haar altijd goed humor en positieve instelling zelfs in zwarte tijden. Wel dank aan mijn collega's zoals Michael, Eva Maria, Mira, Anna Maria en Lucie. En aan mijn voormalig collega's zoals, zoals Axel en Eva voor een niet meer afflatende steun en humor. 
Tot zover. Jullie hebben me genoeg Nederlands oren spreken als een Frans koe. Finally, many thanks to all. Keep supporting each other after the pandemic for the career of young graduates in law. And many thanks, Petra, as well, my former program manager, and wish you the best and we keep contact. Merci beaucoup.